Friendship. Studies have shown that strong friendships lead to greater success in battling illness and higher levels of general life happiness. Friendships have even been shown to contribute to brain health and psychological well-being. But what is friendship? And what is a friend? What is the material from which a healthy friendship is made? Here's a nugget of wisdom from Rabbi David Aaron, a world-renowned spiritual leader and one of my greatest personal rabbis, and what he says about what one needs to engender friendship and love. There are four ingredients to love. The first ingredient to love is making a space in your life for someone else. It's referred to as tzimtzum, to move out of the center and create a space. But of course, the challenge of that is that you can't be self-centered. The secret of love is to move yourself out of the center and create a space for someone else. That's what a hug is. What does it mean when I hug somebody? Why is that a demonstration of love? Because when you hug someone, what you're actually doing is you're saying, I'm creating a space within my life, within my time, within myself, for someone other than me. When asked to boil down the Hebrew Bible into one concept, Hillel, one of Israel's greatest sages said, love your friend as yourself. Everything else is commentary. What does Judaism say about friendship? Why? And what does it mean for our lives today? This week on Israel Inspired Radio. And now, live from Jerusalem, you're listening to Israel Inspired Radio. Here are your hosts, Rabbis Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. Ari, it's good to be back. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeremy. It's good to be here. I love welcoming you to our show. Yes, I love being welcomed to the show. And, and I want you to know the theme we decided to speak about today, I think is particularly fitting after what you and I just did a couple days ago. What was that? I, I said, I need a day off. And you said, where are we going? <laughs> Should I even share this? Yeah. Because, okay. So uh, we, we drove down to the Dead Sea. We were taking a hike around the Dead Sea. And then the highlight of my day, what's the highlight of my day? You tell me. I don't know. You don't know what the highlight of that day was for me? Sitting down and throwing rocks at the... Throwing rocks at the bottle. That is my favorite pastime. (laughs) I love doing that. It reminds me of like us being in the army and that feeling like... Because today things are so intense, so vibrant, constantly going in the iPhones and the this. And when we're in the army and there's no reception and all we have is rocks and like an empty Coke bottle that we could set up and throw at and try to get... That is like my favorite thing to do. <laughs> so we did that. We pulled over to the side and what, for like two and a half hours, we were just throwing rocks at a bottle? <laughs> Pretty much. It was the best. That was the best. And that's sort of what our, our show is about today. It's about friendship. I wouldn't say that throwing rocks at a bottle is... Uh, is our friendship. Is our friendship, but it's one of the nice pluses. <laughs> you know, because also we talk about it a lot too, that in some way we keep each other super duper young because we've been best friends since what? Teenagers? What? Yeah, since we're 19, 20 years old, we've been best friends. So we can easily revert back to that level of immaturity and stupidity. (laughs) And that's great. I never want to feel like, I feel like Peter Pan that way. Yeah. Anyway, so so why why did you think today was a, a good show to do about friendship? Well, I mean, when you think about the way I introduced the show was saying that when you boil the entire Torah down into one concept... Hillel says, Now, usually that's translated as love your neighbor as yourself, but Re'acha is not really your neighbor. Shachen is your neighbor. Re'acha is really, you know, a friend, a colleague. And so if the entire Torah is to love your neighbor as yourself, and so many people nowadays, I feel like either the friendships are somewhat shallow, circumstantial, but if the entire essence of the Torah is to engender love and friendship, then it's worthwhile to really discuss, work out, unpack what friendship really is. Right. Okay. So uh, for me, the reason I like this is because I've been doing a lot of thinking about not only personal levels, but sort of expanding that from the micro to the macro. And while the subject of friendship may seem peripheral or social or lighthearted, the truth is that I believe that we not only would be happier as people, But on a national level, we'd be able to not only neutralize the existential threats we're facing, 
but able to live in harmony and peace with our neighbors and, and with the world. But before we even try to tackle the international macro front, I think the more important front is the individual level, the micro front. So let's start with that. Okay. So let's start with that. So Jeremy, tell me what to you, what is friendship? All right. Well, here's the way I break it down. God creates divine justice and divine compassion, but only we can create human justice and human compassion. Meaning amongst ourselves, God has given us the free will within the framework of this universe that we can implement the concept and ideals of justice and compassion that he's laid out. In fact, the greatest revelation, in my opinion, in the Hebrew Bible is that God speaks to us, that the universe in which we live is not silent, that there is a message permeating throughout the world, a calling throughout the world. And as I said, the essential message is ve'ahavta l'reacha kamocha, to bring love into the world, to create relationships of light in the world. In fact, in the book of Hosea, chapter 6, it says, what does Hashem really desire of us? And this is what he says, for I desire loving kindness, not sacrifice, acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So many people think that it's about the burnt offerings, it's about the, the sacrifices, it's about the rituals, it's about all the meats. They make it halacha. into some sort of abstraction and they get lost in the... In the details yeah. of the commandments. But really he's saying like, listen, really what I want here is love and kindness. I want to, you to acknowledge me through acts of loving kindness. And what better way to do that? Meaning... I remember a few shows ago, one of my favorite thoughts that I continuously think about throughout the day is that a prophet was able to hold God and man in one thought. And that message of Hosea is saying that what does God ask of us to think of him and express it through acts and kindness it to our fellow man. When we live in that world where we have a God consciousness, but it's reflected in kindness to everyone around us, that's really the ultimate. Right. So that's friendship to you. You'd sum it up like that. Well, meaning in some ways it's beyond friendship. It's, some, it's, it's touching on the sublime. It's going beyond. If we think, you know, I've been studying a lot of science lately. I've been reading Gerald Schroeder's book, God According to God. Fantastic book. And it's really been complimenting all the other Einstein and all the other stuff I've been watching and reading about. And, you know, he says that there are two fundamental questions that science really has no answer to. First is, where did this Big Bang come from? Meaning in what time and in what space all of a sudden it happened how? No one has an answer to that yet. I mean, they don't think of the big banger. Science doesn't like talking about that. And the second one is from this massive explosion, how did life emerge from that? Meaning life. I mean, imagine I want to create a video. I don't know if this is a stupid idea, a bad idea, but I thought of it last night where uh, there's a, a, some sort of commercial kind of cartoon explosion. And out of an explosion comes a camel. And then out of this explosion comes a rhinoceros. And out of this explosion comes the DNA strand. And it's like, well, how from this explosion of this Big Bang did life emerge? And science has no answer to that. And then his point is that although many atheists today will claim that morality was a, a genetic engineering through evolution and natural selection, that most scientists today say that morality, love and kindness, is not... Um, evolutionarily programmed within humanity, pleasure and survival is. But morality, love and kindness was revealed to us. It was a revelation that science doesn't really have an answer to, but it was revealed to us well, through well, the Torah. I, w I would have to disagree with the idea that science is saying it's not ge genetically programmed. Because when Adam came on the scene, there was supposedly... This sounds abstract, what's well, the connection to friendship, but humanoid-looking people, like gorillas, but they didn't have the soul. Mm -hmm. The real uh, chidush, the real novel element of Adam, the first man, was the divine soul within him. Mm -hmm. And that divine soul, I believe, has innately programmed within it the desire to connect to God, to come close to God, which one does by being similar to godly attributes, which are love and kindness and morality and all of those I things. Mean, I mean, I could agree with you and say that deep down inside every human soul, I mean, we don't really know this, but I'm willing to go as far as saying that within every human soul, there is deep down this desire for love, kindness, to draw close to God. But what I see is that within societies that have removed themselves from God or taken God out of society, if it's Stalin in Russia or if it's Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, or what could be now in modern America as God is just being removed from every sphere of national life, that the moral 
uh, fibers of society somehow fall away. Human life becomes disregarded. Millions of people can be slaughtered in the name of secularism, of communism, or of Nazi Germany. And once God is removed, it could be that deep, deep, deep down inside of those communist Russians, or even deep, deep down within those Nazis, perhaps there is this inner kmiha, but so many klipotes, so many shells. I don't know metaphysically what's true, but what I do know is when I look at reality, once God is removed from society, the moral fabric of society falls apart. So I'll tell you, last night I was up late uh, trying to prepare for this uh, podcast because I found it very challenging because I feel like I have something deep within me, a message that I really want to share, and I was having difficulty articulating it, even for myself, to really get it out there. So I was just reading through many different quotes about friendship. And I'm just throwing a few ones out there that, that sort of touched me. One was from Helen Keller. She wrote, walking with a friend in the dark is better than walking alone in the light. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a friend may well be reckoned the masterpiece of nature. Charles Darwin, a man's friendships are one of the best measures of his worth. Everyone is singing the accolades of friendship. And it, friendship is so beautiful, but it was leaving this empty void of how and why. You know, what, what is it really about? And when I was just listening to your explanation and you went into the Big Bang and, what, and you brought Hashem into the picture and that's what, it was like a flash of lightning. It almost disappointed me that it was not there in me from the beginning, but that is the key ingredient. That is why friendship today is so elusive, I think. Everyone wants it. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Facebook is all about friends. How many friends do you have? Thousands of friends, when in reality, how many do you really have? The more friends you have on Facebook, it's almost like there's an inverse relationship. The more friends, the on, more Facebook, friends on Facebook, the less you really truly have in some ways, I feel that way. The more time you spend in virtual realities with virtual friends, liking other people's friendship statuses, the less ability you have to really forge deep personal right. and, relationships. Right, and that's why, you know, it says in Ethics of Our Fathers, buy yourself a friend. Now, it's not saying buy with money. It's saying buy Acquire. with with work, with effort, not, not work that's unpleasant work. Like, we have a lot of work that goes into our friendship. But is it, I mean, if we have 20 free minutes, hey, you want to go do nothing? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it, but it, it's work. We, we clash all the time. You know, I, I think about our friendship sometimes, uh, as King Solomon says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and I really think that when I think about our friendship, which is what I want to... To touch on a little bit later, I, I think about that, but you know, you brought up the... Can uh, I just say, I, I, hard work, I feel like, is, is missing it. I would just define, and then I'll hand it right back over to you, is that friendship demands investment. If you want to build a loving relationship with your wife, where she can become your friend, you want to build a relationship with your buddy. Investment. You, investment is the word. You need to invest in that relationship in order to reap the returns. Better word than work. Yes. Yes, I agree. And, and what is the word in Hebrew for friend? Chaver. Chaver comes from chibur, uh, means a connection. So I'm going to tell the story that I've told all around the world because it touches me every time I tell it and it touches everyone around. Because this is a universal condition. The yearning for friendship is a universal condition. So the story is two friends that grew up loving each other very much. One moved to Syria, the other moved to Rome. The friend from Syria goes to visit his friend in Rome, and while he's there, the emperor in Rome says, you're a spy and I'm going to kill you. He says, I'm not a spy. I can prove it. I promise I'll prove it. King says, you're a spy and I'm going to kill you. He says, please, let me go back to my family in Syria, say goodbye, close up my business, I'll come back in 60 days and you could kill me then. King says, what do you think, I'm a fool? You're just not going to return. You're going to stay there. He says, if I don't return, you can kill my friend. And he points to his friend there. The king is shocked. He looks at his friend as if, is that even possible? The friend says, absolutely. He doesn't return, kill me. So the king was intrigued. He says, okay, return back to Syria. He goes back. He closes up his business, closes up shop. He says goodbye to his family. They weep. And he w returns with plenty of time to get back. But on the way back, camel breaks his leg. Ship isn't picking up wind. It's taking him so long. The day of the execution, he's running towards the center of town. He sees the friend standing there with a rope around his neck. They're about to execute him. And he screams, stop, stop, stop. I've returned. Kill me. And the friend with the rope around his neck looks at his watch and says, no, he was supposed to be here at 9.30. It's 10.15. You have to kill me. The friend says, you just made that up. That's not true. You have to kill me. The friend says, no, kill me. Kill. And they're fighting, kill me. And the king is watching all this. And he says, stop. I will make a compromise here, an agreement. No one will die under one condition, that you make me your third friend. 
And when I tell this, especially in the Far East, there's tears in the audience because they value this idea of loyalty and of friendship so much. Everybody in their soul wants it. And why do they want it so much? <laughs> why do they want this friendship? Because number one, there is a feeling that when there's a true friendship, that the presence of God is dwelling upon it, giving it blessing, that God becomes the third friend when, between two people. And I feel like it's because on a macro level, the Jewish people are all part of one soul. And if you take that and you extend it, all of humanity is part of one great soul also, right? So the two real friends are able to actually connect with each other and realize and manifest into reality the reality of the situation. Meaning, what does Aristotle say about friendship? He says, friendship is a single soul dwelling in two bodies. Hmm. That's Aristotle. That's beautiful. And it's really true. That's, well, that's what it is. And that's why I think that, that story touches so much. Because I feel like when we are grooving, this is how I explain our mission. I have a mission in the world that's unique to Ari Abramowitz. You have one that's unique to Jeremy Gimpel. But when we come together with our strengths and our weaknesses and balance each other and we have our real powerful friendship, which we do, it's almost like our missions are both on crack. <laughs> you know, it's like just in, we're able to do such incredible things. I feel like it's because God blesses that. It gives us so much more range in our ability to go deeper into you're able to influence the world and to create. Rea I mean, we're, we each have our, our own strength. So you quoted, love your neighbor as yourself. I am God. Why are those two sentences juxtaposed to each other? Because if we understand that loving our neighbor is loving God, then, that, then the, uh, the key to a real friendship in my mind, the deepest level of friendship, is the God factor. Because if we're able to, A, love ourselves, which I believe we can do to the highest level by recognizing that we are created in, in God's image and God loves us, so we have to love ourselves, then we can love our neighbor as ourself with the realization that we're all part of one soul. I absolutely agree with that. Okay, as I understand it, Hashem reveals himself or more accurately, his will in this world as justice and compassion. If anyone's ever seen the Kabbalistic diagram, so the first two sfirot, the first two funnels, the first two expressions of God that enter into this world are through chesed, kindness, and gvura, which could be translated as justice. And the balance in our lives are always trying to figure out how do we express God's will in the ultimate way that would express justice and compassion. But as Hashem creates this divine justice and compassion, only we can bring it down into this world. As chesed doesn't just mean kindness, it also means love. But more than that, it means love expressed in action. Acts of chesed means taking the love that I feel or the love that I think and then expressing it in the world. Our actions define the love of our lives. And the greatest example that I have right now, just for like my own momentary existence, was a few days ago, my grandfather-in-law, Tehillah's grandfather, fell down and broke his leg. He's not a young man anymore, and he's been in the hospital, had to go through surgery. The whole family was holding our breath. And he's, Baruch Hashem, recovering now in the hospital. And as he's there, everyone has asked us to hold watch on him. And now 24 hours a day, someone within the family and extended family are sitting by his bed, making sure that he's never alone. And I told the family whenever they want, let them know I have a computer, I have a phone, I can stay there for days at a time if I need to, just let me know. A couple of nights ago, they said, Jeremy, we need you to stay there one night. So I got there at nine o'clock at night and I stayed there until eight o'clock in the morning. And I'll tell you, Ari, I really don't like hospitals. It's just who not, likes hospitals. There's some people that love going to hospitals and they love the whole thing of experiencing the the the, the joy that they can bring yes, others. Yes, but then nobody likes the hospital. Nobody likes the well, hospital. To me, if left to my own vices, my dislike of the hospital would overrule my like of helping other people in the hospital. And therefore, unless I am charged to do so by a higher power, I yes. will not go. I, I was to stabbed the in the back. I hate hospitals so much that I I was actually thinking I would rather die than go to the hospital. <laughs> But go ahead. <laughs> so I was there, and you know, I entertained him. I tried to talk to him. I tried to listen to him if I needed to bring him water or help him. You know, I did whatever I could to, you know, to fulfill the mitzvah of bikur cholim. But I was thinking, what greater way would I be able to honor, you know, my grandfather? In what way would I be able to give more 
appreciation to my in-laws? And how would I be able to show my love towards Tahila rather than honoring her grandfather? I can talk about love and I can talk about you know these esoteric ideas of friendship, but until that friendship is brought into action in the world, until it's expressed in action, then it's not real love and it's not real friendship. In today, day and age, the likes on Facebook and the friends on Facebook never allow anyone to really express their friendship and we're living today in a very lonely world. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of depression there. But also because I think that friendships that people try to build are built on a foundation that is not necessarily the healthiest, sturdiest foundation. Because to, to reach out and try to have a friend when you don't love yourself correctly. Uh, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, what did she say? She said... Uh, Friendship with oneself is all important because without it, one cannot be friends with anyone else in the world. Hmm. And that's exactly what the completion of that pasuk that we've really been referring to thematically throughout the show is. Vahavta l'recha kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. You have to love yourself. If you don't love yourself, then any friendship that's built upon a, a, a flawed self concept and a flawed self-love will end up being codependent, will end up being abusive, or some other dynamic that's unhealthy. There needs to be a, a, a self-love before one can build upon that to, to others. That's so true. So just the title friend on Facebook, having 5,000, doesn't do anything. In some ways, the contrast it creates between how many virtual friends you have and how many real friends you have is, is painful. Right. For many. Well, the Midrash on Bereshit talks about something remarkable. Because sometimes when I hear you talk and I sort of step out of my body and listen to myself talk, sometimes it gets so abstract in a Kabbalah and diagrams and God and theory and theology. But the Midrash on the book of Genesis talks about Abraham and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. And they said they brought God into the world, not through theological or metaphysical arguments or logical proofs, not through a military victory to show that God is mighty, but by welcoming strangers into their home and giving them food and shelter. And then when their guests would leave, Abraham and Sarah would say, don't thank us, thank God whose blessing we have shared. And when I think about that story, that is the foundational character of Jewish life. To look at Abraham and Sarah, the first Jews, and how they brought God into the world. It wasn't that they were having, you know, debates against Jews for Jesus and having debates against Muslim imams and trying to create theological proofs or fighting against atheists. It was just showing them the life that I have and the acts, actions that I show you are an expression of the God that I believe in. That's all the proof I need. Like, just look at the life that I live, and then we can both just share in God's blessings. Who you are speaks much louder than what you say, but I'll tell you, it's so I'm so happy you brought up Abraham, because out of all the characters in the Bible, he's the one that is called God's friend. Right. He is God's friend. And in my estimation, what is it that made him, right, Noah, Noah walked with God, and people walked with, but what made Abraham different? What made him God's friend? And I think it was that Abraham was the one that was Vayikra B'Shem Hashem, the one that called out in the name of Hashem, meaning his pain, Hashem's pain was Avraham's pain. Now, what does that mean, Hashem's pain? That it's not that Hashem is lacking anything that he could have pain in a real way, but the existential pain of being in exile with his creations, of wanting to give, creating the world in order to give, and not being recognized, not being able to have that relationship. So Abraham dedicated his life to that relationship, meaning to, that's what a real friend is, where the walls between you are so nullified to some degree, where their pain is your pain, where their joy is your joy. Aristotle said, another Aristotle quote, he said, my best friend is the man who, in wishing me well, wishes it for my sake. <laughs> Meaning it's not about self-interest. He wishes me well because he genuinely, authentically, sincerely wishes me well just for me. And that's why I think Abraham was God's friend, because he's so identified as, uh, as a, a friend to God, as loving God, that he wanted to bring God into the world. I have one more story that I want to share by one of my greatest teachers, um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And he tells the story that he was in the Catskills and he's driving on the side of the road and he sees a guy that has having car trouble and he's outside his car. And he pulls his car over the side of the road and you know at, offers him help. And he sees that uh, the guy's wearing a kippah and he sits and he starts talking to him 
And then the guy, as soon as Jonathan Sachs pull over the car, he takes his keep off and puts it in his pocket. And you know, the rabbi says, excuse me, sir, you know, well, what, what's, why are you putting your keep on? He's like, oh, I'm not Jewish. And he says, you're not Jewish? He's like, yes, if I ever have car problem, I keep a yarmulke, a, a skull cap in the glove compartment of my car. Cause I know that if I put a keep on my head, some Jew will stop for me alongside of the road. And Jonathan Sachs loved that story. When I hear that story, I love that story because it expresses what Jewish society is meant to be. That when we live as a society together for the world to recognize that Jews, strangers driving on the highway will stop for each other because they want to express an act of friendship, an act of chesed in the world, that I believe is our ultimate mission. And that way we will bring a light. And that's what I think Israel does for the world also. Even when people who consider their, themselves our mortal enemies enemies that want our destruction. When Iran has an earthquake, Israel says, okay, you can want to kill us, that's fine, we're not asking you not to, can we send you a help? Can we, you know, Haiti, whatever, we're always trying to give and to give and to give. And I think that's just part of the Abrahamic DNA, that's the Jewish soul, because as all of humanity, we're really one big soul. So that's our message out of Israel. That's this week's Israel Inspired Podcast. As usual, we would love to hear from all of you. Uh, Jeremy at Mizrahi.org, Ari at thelandofisrael.com. And come and visit us in Israel. Experience this magic for yourself. Shalom, shalom.